All righty. Hi, everyone. We are glad to have you all here this evening for our conversation about And the Stars Kept Watch. I'm Gretchen Ipok. I am our collection development librarian here at the Upper Darby Township Library. Also with me tonight is Maria Polinakos, who is the Assistant Director of Library Services for Upper Darby Township Library. And here is what we are all here to discuss and the stars kept watch. We have two guests with us this evening connected to this story. One is the author, Peter Friedrichs. So welcome, Peter. Thank you. Another is therapist, um, Dr. Robert Heasley, um, who is a friend and a character in this story. And a character just and in general. <laughs> I knew you'd say that, Peter. I know you knew. We do wish that we could have had this program in person because both of these gentlemen are actually local, um, but we're not currently doing indoor programming at the Upper Darby Township Library, so we are very grateful for their online presence with us this evening. I will say Maria and I are new to Zoom programming. Um, we apologize in advance for technical difficulties or any other things that we have to figure out on the fly. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> So if you didn't already read and the stars kept watch, we actually do have three physical copies available for checkout from the Upper Darby Township Library. And it is also available as an instant borrow from our Hoopla service that we subscribe to that you can get with your library card from home. Uh, Maria is going to put that link in the chat. If you are interested in purchasing a copy of this book and you have not done so already, you can definitely get it from Peter's website, which Maria will also put in the chat. And it is available, of course, from all um, major online retailers as well. It's currently on sale for a pretty good price on Amazon if you're an Amazon shopper. For this evening, we have limited the chat to directly um, contacting myself or Maria. And the reason we did that is because we want you to use the chat to ask questions and to make comments for our speakers this evening. If you would like to add something to the conversation in the chat, please direct message Maria and she will either insert questions as they are relevant to the conversation or she will um, hold them to the end for our hopefully Q&A session if we don't go too long with the, <laughs> with the chatting. Also, um, Peter has specifically asked that questions and comments don't contain book spoilers. So if you um, if you have something you want to ask, um, please try to phrase it in a way that does not give away um, plot points or actions or anything that happened in the story. And if you haven't read the book, then please after this go do so and you won't feel like you have um, had the whole thing told to you. <laughs> Okay, so before we start the conversation, I did just want to say that the plot of And the Stars Kept Watch stems from an accidental death, um, too, actually, and we're not going to be focusing on that trauma in the conversation. However, it can be a very tough subject, and all of us completely understand if someone needs to step away from this conversation at any time. Um, we just wanted to make that clear, um, because before this event started, we were talking about um, the quantity of tissues that were needed to read the story. It does have some, some challenging moments. Um, and I understand if that um, is not something that you can do at this moment. So I'm going to start us out here by introducing Peter and Robert with their official bio so you can get a feel for where they're coming from. So Peter Friedrichs is the author of the novel And the Stars Kept Watch, published by Atmosphere Press. Although he now lives in Swarthmore with his wife, Irene, he has spent most of his life in Maine and New Hampshire. His novel is set in Southern Maine, and that landscape has a significant influence on the book's protagonists. In his writing, Peter strives to help us understand more fully what it means to be human. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Amherst College, a JD from Georgetown Law, and a Master's of Divinity degree from Andover Newton Theological School. After spending nearly 20 years practicing law, Peter was ordained to the ministry in 2006 and called to serve as the pastor of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Delaware County in Media, Pennsylvania. And The Stars Kept Watch is his first novel. 
And I would like to add it received a starred review in Booklist, which is a huge deal in library world. And I am so pleased to be able to say about that about this book. Um, I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Gretchen. And now we also have with us this evening, Dr. Robert Heasley, PhD, LMFT, who is a licensed psychotherapist with offices in Philadelphia and Swarthmore. Robert specializes in individual and relationship therapy. He works with individuals, couples, and families addressing a range of concerns, including relationships that are in crisis due to infidelity, sexuality, parenting, and loss. He specializes in work with men addressing concerns with parenting, intimacy, and the effects of social expectations and practices associated with social norms and masculinity. He is co-editor of Sexual Lives, Theories and Narratives of Human Sexualities, which is from McGraw-Hill, and is a past president of the American Men's Studies Association and a former co-director of the Philadelphia-based Men's Center for Growth and Change. So welcome, Robert. Thank you. So I was just wondering if there's um, anything either one of you would like to say to get the conversation started. Peter, if you want to tell us a little bit about um, your novel or... Um, sure. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Sounds like a good place to start. But first, let me just say thank you, Gretchen and Maria, for hosting this this evening. Uh, you, you've both been so supportive of this work, and uh, I am deeply grateful that you've set this up and to have so many people here tonight. I recognize many of the names, but not all. So welcome. Uh, as Gretchen mentioned, this is my first novel. And um, it is something of an accidental novel, which um, I'd like to just unpack a little bit. I, I, um, I didn't start out to write a novel. I started out writing um, a dream, actually a nightmare that I had had. And I, this nightmare um, haunted me for months. Um, and so finally I decided, well, maybe the only way to, to get it out of my head would be to write it down. And that nightmare is the precipitating event at the start of the book. There's no surprise. There is a, um, uh, an accident that's, that's caused by Nathan, who's one of the protagonists. He's the father of two young boys. And as Gretchen mentioned, the two young boys um, die in that accident. And that was the nightmare that I had that I was living with that it actually had happened to members of my family. And so you can imagine how deeply disturbing that was. So I decided to sit down and write it out and try to get it out of me. And I did. And then I thought about, well, what would happen to the mother and father of these two children after this terrible, terrible tragedy? And what would happen in their relationship? And so I started to write that. And that is what became this book. And I was so uh, thrilled. Robert and I have been friends for 15 years. Uh, I have a, the greatest amount of respect for Robert and what he does professionally. And um, he served as a very willing consultant to this work as it went through many, many um, iterations. And, uh, and if you read the book or if you have read the book, there is a Robert Heasley who's a therapist in the book and he graciously allowed me to actually use his name and, and preserve his name as one of the characters. So I was deeply grateful to have Robert um, uh, walk this journey with me. Robert, did you want to, do you, is there anything you want to say about, about sort um, of the, watching this process unfold? Well, yeah, I can speak to watching how many renditions a, a manuscript goes through Peter and your tenacity and staying with this project <clears throat> was amazing and awesome and, and, and inspiring in many ways. But I, I think that I'm reminded in working with you on this, <clears throat> that when I read a novel or any published work, I only see the finished product and I don't have the behind the scenes compassion and understanding for how much goes in and how many years goes into that, into that process. Um, so the novel is one, as Peter described it, a dream turned into a novel um, and I think turned into a message about, about human lives and, its, and our complexities and the contradictions and the passions we live with. Um, but I, I've been honored to be part of the project. Thanks. That is really interesting to hear how the story came about. Um, I was actually wondering about the impetus because it seemed a very strong 
precipitating event, like you said, it makes a lot of sense that it came to you as a, as a nightmare. Um, so Peter, it seems like a lot of parts of your background are kind of wrapped up in this book and the stars kept watch and I was wondering um, if there are any parts of your personal or professional experiences that gave you direction or informed how you put your story together? I Absolutely, Gretchen. My, um, my ministry has um, really um, provided me with the insights that I offer in this book. And in fact, um, one, of, one of the members of my church who's read it said, this book really is an extension of your ministry, which I took as a tremendous compliment. Um, I, have, I have had the, the privilege of, of um, being able to walk with people through uh, some of their darkest times, as well as some of their, their brightest times. And so my work as a church pastor certainly has informed um, this novel. And, and uh, it, when, when you read it, you'll see that they, there is also not just uh, Robert Heasley as a therapist, but, but Catherine, the, uh, the mother and, and wife of Nathan, uh, is, is uh, supported by a Unitarian Universalist pastor through this process. Uh, not, not autobiographical necessarily, but certainly um, having been through what I've been through with a lot of uh, families, a lot of individuals, that, that definitely informed uh, the writing here. So um, I know you mentioned you two have been friends for a long time, but I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how you became acquainted and how that relationship helped develop the story um, as, as you were writing it. And Robert, you can jump well, in too. Yeah, yeah. I'll start. I'll start, Robert, and then you can jump in. But I, so, so the the primary support that that Robert offered. Well, there are two things. One was sort of the technical aspects. Um, I would I would write um, write a bit and then ask Robert to read it, especially parts around um, how. Uh, Nathan was being supported therapeutically and saying, am I on the right track? Is this the sort of thing that a therapist would do with, with someone in this position? And, and Robert was able to give me feedback around that. Um, and so that was really, for me, very important sort of technical, um, technical help. And then more so than that, Robert just was so encouraging saying, this is really good writing and keep going. And, and there, it's such a, such a, um, up and down process to, to spend four years uh, producing this and uh, Robert was unflagging in his support and, and so that was that was the other vital um, sort of uh, link for me that I had with Robert. Uh, you're muted Robert I think. Gretchen can you unmute yeah. Robert? Um or allow him to unmute. Yeah, I just there we go. All right. There we go. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, I I think the involvement for me and the belief in the, the work was that it was such an emotionally driven story. And if there's anything that um, that I know from my practice as a therapist is that emotions are something we often avoid. Um, don't want to deal with. We want to go to anything except a deeper inner feeling that we might be carrying around or witnessing other people's emotions. And I think that the certainly the novel gives us an inside um, view of of what emotions look like when from the inside out. Um, both the care both char main characters, the parents, the um, other characters in the novel. There's a lot going on. And for Peter to be able to write from that emotional space is really, really important. And I, you know, back to your earlier question, Gretchen, I think Peter and I connected with each other. We both moved to the Swarthmore area around the same time. I think you were a year earlier than, than my wife and I. And I um, connected with Peter around him being a male who is open about processing feelings, willing to really take walks and talk about what's going on in his life. I, not as a therapist, but as a dear friend, value his friendship for allowing me to do that with him, um, for sharing our inner stories so that our inner selves get known to, a, to, to others that can hold the space for us. 
um, to, to feel. And I think the novel represents those kinds of values. And, and I would say um, to Gretchen that, that one of the things, I, I hope one of the messages that comes through this story is that um, uh, we, we are not able to live our lives in isolation and that we really need to build and to, to um, uh, draw upon the support systems that, that we have in place to get through those hard times. And, and Robert and I spent a lot of time talking about that aspect of Nathan and Catherine's um, uh, grieving and recovery from grief. And, um, and so I think that the, the idea that um, it takes a village for all of us to get through life on a, on a daily basis is um, hopefully something that, that folks who read this will take away from reading it. Well, more than just hearing about the book, Robert, I just wanna thank you for those gorgeous words about your friendship. Um, I think that was just an amazing thing to be able to hear um, about that connection that you have had all these years. Um, and Robert, while we're on the subject of you, how does it feel to have your name immortalized in fiction? <laughs> Do you regret it? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm waiting for an offer from the movie industry for having that role in the film. <laughs> um, but I don't know how long I'll wait, Peter. Um, but I, yeah, it, it was lovely. And it was a certainly a gift, so symbolic of Peter, I think who I knew created a character that used my suggestions and my sharing a lot. Um, and then to have him do the final draft and say, you know, I'd like to keep your name in this because he had used names he was familiar with throughout the earlier versions and then changed names as the, as the final edits came in. And he said, I'd like to keep using your, you know, use your name. And, and I, I, I remember getting sort of teary, I just saying, that's so precious that you would bring me into your novel. And, um, and so it felt, yeah, it was a gift. And, you know, there's a notion of, in my field, and I think just in the world about developing the safety for emotional intimacy. And, and I think for men, that isn't always the, where we grew up, um, to have that ability to connect with other men in that way. And so it was certainly an indicator to me or a verifying, Force to have Peter want me to be <laughs> a public presence in his novel. And there's been several people who have stopped me on the streets of Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, and say, I just read about you in the novel. And I said, thank you very much. So thank you, Peter. Well, that's actually My pleasure. really cool. Like recognition. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I have to say, I, I did go back and check because after we talked about having this conversation, I said, wait, I think that was the actual name of the guy in the book. There are, there are um, blog posts and books written about how do you, how do you choose your character's names in your novels? And I, uh, you know, people do everything from, from, you know, point at a phone book, a page in the phone book to, to agonizing for weeks over what this character's name is going to be. As Robert said, when I, the first draft, I used all names of people that I knew and I just kept them in there the whole time. And um, uh, there is actually the, the, the name of the pastor um, that helps support Catherine is the name of, uh, of a childhood friend of one of my daughters. And I got her permission to leave her name as well because I just got attached to, to uh, Reverend Susan and to Robert. So um, I just, I didn't want to waste time in the writing trying to think of what names to use. So I just used names of people I knew and, uh, and a couple of them stuck. It's good that you got everyone's permission, but I completely understand getting attached to those characters. So, so I, you spoke to this both a little bit, um, but Robert, I, I just wanted to ask you, how did you make sure that, that Peter was accurately representing your profession? I mean, he was kind of putting words in your mouth. Did you want to go back and revisit any of those or how did that work? Well, I read, well, Peter and I took many walks um, and talked about the character, talked about the therapist role, talked about when do these characters enter therapy? Um, what are they feeling when they come into the room? What is the therapist feeling when the characters enter that space? And of course, 
as Peter said, Nathan, Catherine, both um, see individual therapists. And, and for both of them, trying to figure out what happens you know, in my office when somebody comes initially in, um, particularly in the midst of crises um, of whatever nature. And what is it that I need to anticipate? What is it that I need to do to create a safe space? And what is it that they're feeling when they're coming in? Um, and so I drew both on my own experience in therapy, um, what I felt in the midst of life, some life crises I went through earlier in my life, and then my experience as a therapist. Um, and what I valued in the process is that Peter <clears throat> used those descriptions really well in terms of building the, um, the scenarios, the scenes in which those interactions took place. But more even than outside the, the therapist's office itself is his work with each of those central characters um, presenting their inner um, feelings, their struggles, their anger, their shame, their, their struggles with each other, their struggles within themselves. And so the emotional um, insight that Peter was able to bring to those characters, the emotional attention he was able to bring, set the stage for why the therapist could play the role that they could play and could be the use that they could be as, as resources to those characters. Someone did just send me a question that is relevant here, I think, and that is, have either of you recommended this kind of writing in your therapy or pastoral practices because it seems like it was healing I recommend it. Uh, yeah, I do recommend journaling, writing um, for, for clients, particularly in the midst who are going through really strenuous periods, um, the loss of marriages, <clears throat> the loss of a partner through death. Um, many things happen, but I, I really value the, the, the journaling, the storytelling, the telling the story of what's going on. Um, I haven't had anybody turn their work into a novel, but I certainly feel like that expression is helpful. And it sounds like to you, Peter, it was helpful to write the dream, to get it out into a, a more accessible place for you, rather than- Right, I could, I, 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 I could externalize it when it had been, it had been mm -hmm. so deeply internalized. Uh, so that enabled me to process it better. But I think going to the, the question that was asked, um, uh, I think that, that writing fiction gives us the opportunity to explore some of these topics um, in ways that are can be more accessible to to readers than some nonfiction. Uh, I had one comment I received from from uh, someone who read the book is that it was um, uh, the best self-help book he's ever read mm. and mm. that to me was just high praise mm. and um, uh, you know it's not it, it, it doesn't have to say do this do that uh, try this, try that, but but hopefully yeah. readers who are facing struggles can glean uh, first of all that there there is hope. Uh, hope is a is a central the um, theme to this book, and I don't want our our uh, attenders to think that it's all doom and gloom and grief. It starts out that way, certainly, uh, and and many people have said that they've been able to only read the first couple chapters and they have to put it down and walk away for it from uh, from it for a while. But ultimately, this is a story of hope, and um, and and so I'm I'm hoping that even though it is fictional and the characters are fictional, the events are fictional, that uh, folks can see themselves in it and see the potential that they have to, uh, to reach that place of, of hope and recovery and, and healing. Yeah. I was just, I'll pick up in a second, just briefly, the, the, the term recovery, to me, I use it in, in, in a way of thinking of it as rediscovery of possibilities of, of reclaiming a sense of self, a sense of hope um, that was lost through the crises. But it's really a discovery process in order to be have of, of what's possible. Um, and, and that's an important theme that you're right, Peter, in that novel. So when I read your book, Peter, I felt like it was very organic, like these people really were 
going through a grieving process as you were writing them. And so I was wondering how much of, of your book was plotted out versus how much did you actually do as you were just kind of writing these people? Did it just kind of develop or were you headed in a certain way? I, it, it, it was totally organic. I had no idea where this was going to go. I, I didn't know that I was write, writing a book uh, until I realized I'd written about 120,000 words. I, 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 um, I did not plot it out ahead of time. I didn't um, um, really conceive of, of the, um, the arc, the dramatic arc of the story in advance. What I, this is, and this is part of what I really enjoyed about the writing process because so much of my writing in the past, either in, in my legal work and um, as well as for, for the church, is is purposeful and um, it has a I'm trying to, to get to a certain point and whether it's drafting a contract or it's writing a sermon in this case for me I just really enjoyed the process of discovery and so I would sit down to write and without I, I would just let things flow and um, and characters would show up subplots we'd go down a rabbit hole one way or another and and, um, and, and that's what made it fun for me, really. It, it wasn't that I had it all figured out from the, from the get-go. And, um, and so that was rather than, you know, and, and this, isn't my, uh, this isn't my day job. So I, I didn't have all that much writing on it. I could just, just take the time and enjoy that process. I um, just got a, a comment here from someone else um, who said when Robert used the word tension, it just nailed it for them. Mm. In your writing, Peter, you created and kept this tension going through the entire book that drove this person to continue reading. And so managing yeah. um, that, that tension um, can be applied to many situations in our life. And they said, thank you, Peter and Robert, definitely a story of hope. So. Thank you. I you think you hear that. Yes, thank you. So um, you did talk a little bit about your pastoral work, Peter, and so I wanted to ask, um, this book has spiritual elements, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's religious. Um, so I was just wondering how you considered questions of spirituality and religion during the writing process. And Robert, feel free to jump in if you have something to add from your perspective as well. Thanks. So um, I, I think my, my own personal theology is reflected in a lot of what's in this book. And the, the spirituality of it really speaks to uh, what it means to be human, what it means to live a human life in this span of years, and to uh, respond to what's, what comes at us. And our commitment to, um, to our values, our commitment to relationships, our commitment to love, all those things uh, to me are, are spiritual components. I don't need to, um, to link that necessarily to the, the existence of a supreme being or to the ideas of heaven or hell. Um, to me, uh, these two human beings who are facing the worst, absolutely worst conceivable event uh, of their lives are encountering each other on a spiritual level um, they're being supported by their therapists spiritually as well as emotionally and psychologically. Uh, to me, it's all a package, really. Um, and so uh, I, th this was, you're right, this is not a religious book. It's not, it's not promoting a particular um, angle on that at all. It really is, as I said, in, or you said in my bio, um, it's about how, how we can live as human beings um, with all the uncertainties uh, and vagaries of our lives. And, and that sounds is, terribly high-minded. I <laughs> so, <laughs> so forgive me, but but you asked the question. Yeah. You can tell that you speak for a living, that just that you're able to to say these amazing things. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that what you said, Peter, in terms of the spiritual is you know, it's just the authentic part of our authentic self. And and that, you know, we carry our spiritual self with us, not a religious kind of component of it, but there is the meaning making we humans do and the adaptations, the confusion we live with and, and how we kind of let ourselves feel the feelings have to do with it, emotional 
kind of release that's also about, about a, 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 you know, I wouldn't say a fractured spirit that happens in this novel that has to be reclaimed in terms of, and it gets back to hope. You know, if, if nothing else, hope is a spiritual experience. Um, it's not tangible, it's not physical, it's spiritual. And, and I'd just like to throw in here, um, I, clearly I didn't undertake writing this novel in anticipation of a pandemic, but, but um, I do think that there are kind of universal messages in this book that apply to what all of us have been through and are going through now. 750,000 deaths in the United States, 5 million worldwide from, from COVID-19. Um, we are all experiencing trauma and tragedy and some of it is very, very personal, um, and we've lost loved ones. Uh, for others, it's it's the communal trauma and tragedy. And um, <clears throat> one of the one of the sort of life lessons I think that's contained in this book is to say uh, we all grieve differently, and there isn't any specific right way to experience grief and to process grief. And this is something, I, I, Robert, I'd love to have you kind of um, expand on a little bit is about how we, how we grieve, especially in a moment like this. Um, and, and it's maybe getting away from the book itself, but, but to me, this is the context in which the book's being read at this point. In that sense of, of how do we experience the impossible? And grief is, is, you know, grief is, all grief is about loss, isn't it? And it's about an unanticipated loss many times, anticipated loss. Um, it can be, in some situations, a feeling of, a mixed feeling of relief from a bad marriage and yet a loss of that marriage and its hope um, in the terms of the death that take place. It wasn't anticipated. It wasn't a, a relief of anything. It was the opposite of that. But grief itself, it seems to me, is, you know, is best responded to by, by us when we allow ourselves to experience it, when we let ourselves cry, when we let ourselves be supported um, by others, when we invite others to support us. Um, I was thinking about the classic, and as a result of a conversation actually with a client this afternoon, who had had some loss um, to, a, to a loss of a husband who had recently passed. And, and she said, people keep saying, what can I, you know, if you need me, I, I'm going to be here for you. And, and I said, well, what would you like them to say? Because she was like, ah, she said, I, wanna, I just want them to say, what do you need from me? I don't want to have to say, if I need you, I'll call you. But rather, if they could just say, what do you need from me right now? And sometimes I just need to be left alone. Sometimes I need to go, go for a walk with somebody. Um, but we need to allow ourselves to grieve and to ask for the support we need to do our own version of grieving, whatever that is. Um, and knowing that, that without that support, we can be pretty isolated. So both offering it as well as being able to receive it becomes really critical. And, and Robert, thinking about Nathan's um, grieving here, it's, it's complicated by the guilt he experiences as well right. for his responsibility in the accident. And I'm wondering, are there, so guilt can get in the way of the grieving um, sometimes. And I'm wondering if there, there are other uh, emotional responses to tragedy or trauma that kind of um, are, are barriers to our ability to, to grieve appropriately um, and maybe slow down that process of, of mm. healing. Mm. Well, it's, it's important that you said that because I think certainly with, with Nathan's character, the guilt, the, um, the mother's character and the anger and resentment um, that's there and various characters around them taking judgmental roles. Um, I think it, there is something about judging others that leads us away from our, our best selves. Um, you know, things happen that people don't intend to happen. And, and being able to experience re, re, reducing um, the resentment, releasing the resentment in order to allow the grief to show up in its, in its fullness. Um, the heart opens up. The, the, the guilt is 
real, and yet it's regret that it can turn into that then allows the grieving to, to, to move forward. So I think that there are layers, as you're suggesting, Peter, in order to, to release those layers and uncover it in order to allow the, the grief just in its wholeness. Um, it's beautiful because we only grieve what we loved um, and lost. So we have gone into some of the other things that I wanted to talk about, and that was um, fantastic. I just wanted to follow up with a question of um, related to the family and friends in the book who, while not always perfect, do keep showing up um, for Catherine and Nathan um, with material and emotional support through the story. So I was wondering, um, I really liked what Robert said about, you know, instead of just saying, you know, call me if you need me, like asking, right, what, what can I, what, what do you need from me right now? Um, are there other things that are, are helpful for family and friends to, to do that are, are truly assisted, assisting, that are like genuinely helpful? Um, and then the other thing I wondered is when there's a loss, you know, many people are maybe feeling that loss simultaneously. So what, how is it different to support someone else versus supporting maybe the community around you? Like if you were all friends with somebody or if it was a sibling or something where there's, it's not just a one direction kind of support, you know, where you're sort of having to mutually support each other. <laughs> what, does, what does that look like? I'll let the pro field these <laughs> questions. <laughs> I'm thinking, so Gretchen, say that last part again. What does it look like well, around? I was just Go ahead. thinking, you know, if, if someone has a very significant loss to, them, to themselves, mm -hmm. um, supporting that person through grief might look different than if the grief is being felt equally among a certain group. Right. Mm -hmm. But if there's a group that's experienced the loss, yeah. then what does that look like? You know, Maybe in a, in, a in a community setting, for example. Community, yeah, and it, you know, I, I think about it in terms of, <clears throat> and it's the words are, are holding the space, but creating the space for the group to, to share the grieving, to create ritual. Certainly we know, you know, we humans are very ritually oriented um, and to be able to intentional create the intention of creating space. And most religious practices have some mechanism for providing that. But outside of that, I think about a friend of ours um, who recently lost his wife and to an unanticipated um, brain tumor and, and, and the, the community of his family, his, her children, his children, um, their close network of, of family members who were close to the woman who died they had to come together and sit together um, in order to be able to watch and witness each other's feelings, to share them. And, and in, in both a religious context, they did that, but they did it in a non-religious context in order to, to have time that was just sharing. But holding space becomes really important. And then what goes on in that space has gotta be just what comes out of the people that are in it. But um, the isolation doesn't usually serve us well, particularly when we share a common love or a common experience. Um, and certainly, even what you were saying, Peter, I feel like there are more, there is more um, great value in, now that we're moving in a different stage of COVID, we can reflect back over the last two years of our lives and sitting in community, <clears throat> that we've all shared the same experience of, of the effects of isolation and desperation at times. Um, and we still live with it to some extent, but creating community around what is the feeling? What's, what has this journey been like? Um, allows voice to, 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 those, to those experiences. And it's the voice that provides the insight and, and makes the connection from one to the other. Yeah, and, and Gretchen, to, to the first part of your question, um, I do think the, the, the 
easiest thing to do and the hardest thing to do is to simply show up. And I, I think about um, Ginger in, in, in the book, who is um, Catherine's best friend. And mm -hmm. she just appears periodically throughout the story. She comes over and sits and has a cup of coffee with Catherine. She um, meets her for a walk. She, um, uh, she, she just is there. And she's this uh, person who doesn't shy away from being in the presence of someone who's suffering. And as I say, that just being there sounds so easy, but that can be so challenging to to be um, in that in that aura, if you will, of someone who is is going through this deep grieving. And and um, <clears throat> to me, that showing up is is everything. Um, and you can bring a casserole if you want, but the casserole is the vehicle that gets you to the door because you have to deliver it, right? So, so um, if that's what it takes for, you, for someone to show up for someone else who's, in, who's, who's going through uh, this kind of experience, then I'll, by all means, bring a casserole, but you don't need to bring the casserole, you just need to get to the door. I think that's a really good way of, of putting it. Um, it's hard to kind of put yourself out there. Um, knowing that it, it's, it may not be, you know, a super fun visit or, um, you know, but knowing that you're really providing something that this other person needs and, and uh, can be really meaningful, but it's sometimes hard to open ourselves up to that, I think. Well, we're, we're so oriented, particularly in our culture, toward doing things. We have to do something. What can we do? And, um, and there's nothing that can be done in this, in this instance or in instances of other tragedy, uh, you, you, you can't fix it. It, it. And so getting out of that, that mindset of, I wanna do something, I wanna fix it, I wanna make them feel better. And just saying, I, wanna, I want you to know you're not alone. Um, mm. That is such a powerful, powerful message. I, I wanna add just a thought to that grieving process as well that connects to what you were saying, Peter, it's about showing up and, and holding the space, but not controlling the space so that the person who's grieving is allowed to have their grief. They don't need to be told it's going to be okay, um, but rather just stay right where you are. If I'm crying over a loss, the most important piece for me from somebody who's supporting me is to hear it's okay, take your time, take your time, stay right there, stay right there. So allow my tears to be there. Don't let me feel guilty or shamed by my tears. Allow me to have them and just know that I'll work it, I'll, I'll, they'll come out and then I'm gonna breathe when I'm ready to breathe. And then you're gonna say, just keep taking that breath. Beautiful what you just did. That affirmation is our, expression of our humanity and that expression of our tears is our expression of our humanity. Yeah, that's beautiful, Robert. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think one thing that I appreciated about the book, and you both have spoken to this a little bit, um, even right now, um, is that it does show different perspectives and paths about grieving, and it never comes right out and says, there are a lot of ways to do this. But it demonstrate, demonstrates, you know, through the whole thing, um, that it's it's not linear, and it's not always going to look the way we think it's going to look. Um, and I I really liked what you both said about making space for other people's grief, and just to understand that what it looks like for you is maybe different than what it might look like for me, um, and that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, appreciate that. Um, so this book does involve trauma and we, we talked about, we, we've talked about a fair amount of different things, but we have focused on, on a little bit about death. Um, grief is an emotional response that we can have to a lot of situations, things that seem really large or everyday things that are just challenging to us. Um, so how do we sort of recognize and give ourselves space for grief in our everyday lives? Just a small loss. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Get to that feeling and not just 
squished it down a lot. <laughs> 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 I'll 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 start, Robert, and, and um, um, you you can you can add in. Um, I, I think that from my perspective, it, it starts with slowing down, and um, and Robert referred to earlier about holding space. I think it sometimes it takes uh, acts of of intention and will to create space, and it is so easy to to go through the blur of our day and get to the end and not even remember that we've lived it. And so um, if we are going to be able to um, to experience uh, grief uh, on whatever level we, we may have encountered it, uh, it, it begins with, with creating that space. And that could be reflecting at the end of the day. I mean, uh, uh, grief and gratitude, both for that matter. You know, a lot of people keep a gratitude journal that they'll mm -hmm. write in at the end of the day. Some people will get up in the morning and, and, um, um, meditate just you have to i think it starts with with making space mm -hmm. and and it does and it's giving ourselves permission i i am reminded of um something i'm gonna say my wife <clears throat> betsy crane often says is we oftentimes find ourselves in a position of feeling grief and then saying well i shouldn't be feeling this now it's been a long time and as Betsy says, nobody, want, nobody needs to be shit upon. And, and if I'm having the feeling, it's the feeling I'm having. And if I can allow myself to have it, then it's going to, to have a place to be released. And I was also thinking in terms of that process involves knowing that it's not a one-time event. You know, I was thinking about about the parents in this book, they're going to have periods long into their future where they're going to remember these incidences, the crises that they, they've experienced, the marriage that they experienced, the love that they they had, and, and they're going to sit and cry. And it's going to be 10 years from now, and it's going to happen. And they're going to let, and, and they're going to, in the best of all worlds, they're going to let themselves have the tears because our history doesn't go away. Um, it lingers and it doesn't have the impact over time, but it doesn't go away. Yeah, and, and I think Robert too, that, that what I sometimes um, refer to as the tyranny of the shoulds, mm -hmm. um, that applies to, to allowing ourselves to feel joy amidst our mm -hmm. grief. And it's like, why, I, why am I laughing? I shouldn't be laughing right now. Uh, or I'm in, I'm in pain, and yet I can appreciate this sunset. Um, and, and so uh, just like it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of uh, process, each experience within that process can, it is your experience and how you experience it. And there, there's no prescription as to the way it should be. Nice. Because the added piece for me and what you just said, which was brilliant, Peter, was the idea of the loss as being the loss of love. But that love had incredible joy attached to it, had incredible positives attached to it. And so that we don't just stay with the loss, but we revisit the joy. And so that it becomes this memory that's, that brings us pleasure, that brings us a smile and the loss that brings us our tears, but both of those deserve space and are legitimate and important to allow in. I would love to keep talking to you all night, but I, <laughs> I want to give our audience a chance to uh, have their questions asked. And so Maria, I was wondering if you have any questions. I actually have one that came to me. I, I do have one very interesting two-part question about the writing process. How much writing, Peter, wound up on the cutting room floor? <laughs> and are there chunks of the story that were edited out that you found hard to let go? Uh, so, uh, yes, there were. And um, uh, I think that the, the story started, I mean, because I wrote it, 
without any clear plot. It, it it did involve a lot of twists and turns that that were uh, that that, as my editor said, didn't advance the plot, the main plot. So um, it was probably about twice as long as as well, maybe one and a half times as long as it ended up being. And I think there were four full rewrites as I went through the process. And um, and there were some significant plot lines that I've dropped that um, early readers that had that read those plot lines are like, you can't get rid of that. Don't get rid of that. You need that. And um, and uh, but you just you, nobody's going to pick up an 800 page novel novel from a first time author. I can tell you that. So um, to make it make it more manageable, I had to wrestle it to the ground and and get it down to uh, to to about 400 pages, which is still pretty significant. Mm -hmm. You know, having read the first very first draft and then all the drafts through, uh, you're, I, I love the question, Ruth, because there is sort of this, from the outside, it's like, Peter, this is amazing. And when I read the first draft, I thought, these, these subplots are incredible. And I love that you took us in a direction and played with this. And then I had to sort of come to terms with my own sense of loss because some of those plots that I love so much <laughs> were on the cutting room floor and um, and maybe future novels you could just pick those back up and stick them in the future Peter but, <laughs> but I just admit that the final product as I came to know it and see it evolve became a, a just a, a much more streamlined story that didn't get distracted it didn't get distracted by other by other material that would have been interesting but not necessary to, to I think the, the novel the core novel the plot itself yeah and and um, just so folks know a little more about the process after I had a full first draft I did um, hire a freelance um, developmental editor who went through and really helped me out um, in, in in that streamlining process that Robert referred to and um, and then after that, I had um, the editors at Atmosphere Press who who took me through another full rewrite as well. So um, so it it takes I, I needed the expertise of the experts because this was the first time I'd ever done anything like this. And I think there is something, Peter, to I imagine to be said about having the outside readers and versus having having me as a really close friend saying, I just love everything you said. <laughs> <Versus> <laughs> my mother too. My mother, my mother's like, you can't get rid of that. Part. Yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> no, I, and, and I have a lot of, a lot of what, what are called beta readers. Uh, some of them are on the call tonight, invaluable insights and, and uh, contributions that they made as well. I encourage you when you read the book to read the acknowledgements, because I hopefully have been able to thank all of those people who every step of the way were, were supporting me especially my family and especially Irene, my wife. We have another question from the audience. Um, this audience member says, I can imagine using this book in a book group. Would you consider creating a guide to use in a group, such as questions, reflections for each chapter, maybe using rituals that you referenced as well? The, uh, so I'll tell you that uh, at the at the back of the book there are some some questions that I, I prepared with the idea that uh, this might be a good book group book and so the, the question there are some questions there and uh, I love the idea of ritual uh, helping people to experience ritual and and, and the like as well I, that's not a direction that I have gone but I will also say if if there's a book group who would like to to uh, pick this up, I'd be happy to zoom in uh, to, to the group and, and contribute to the conversation as well. I think that's great. I can see this book being very discussable. So thank you for offering that. Um, a question did come to me asking, now that you're an author, are you encouraged to write a second book? <laughs> I, I, it's a frequently asked question, and I, I liken it to um, having given birth, and then and then you ask the mom, "So, are you going to have another baby?" Uh, um, probably more painful to give birth physically, but this was a, a long process. I I would love to write more. Um, I really enjoyed this process. I will tell you that. 
for me, and maybe it's a convenient excuse, but the pandemic has really affected my ability to express myself creatively. And so I, I did start, um, uh, I've got about five chapters written of, a, of another maybe novel, uh, but I just haven't been able to focus that well and, and sit down and write. So I'm hoping to do that in the future and, um, um, and, and explore other aspects of, of uh, sort of the human condition. Maria, are there any more uh, questions? No, Gretchen, not at the moment. Okay, great. Um, well, it is getting close to eight o'clock. And so I just wanted to wrap up um, with a more hopeful question to end us tonight. And that is, you know, intense grief experiences can really expose cracks and divisions in our, even the healthiest families or friendships or whatever. So I was wondering, how can we invest in each other every day to shore up our relationships for when we face these kinds of challenges? So this is the, the hopeful part. Like, what can we do to support each other in the good times? Hmm. Reverend Peter, do you want to take that? Yeah, I, um, so this gets to the spiritual, back to the question of, of spiritual uh, for me, because I, I do think it, it comes down to connection. And it's about maintaining connection and reinforcing connection. So um, if, it, you know, it's as simple, I think, as, as uh, picking up the phone or sending a text and, and um, not letting our relationships drift and drift apart. And um, uh, so, so whatever we can do to, to reinforce those connections in the, in the good times, in the normal times, if you will, um, that will help to make sure that they are strong when they need to be. Yeah, I, yeah, and I agree, Peter. And and the other thought that I have <clears throat> is what I have come to thought, think about is intentional relationships that that we create um, and go after, seek after those core people in our lives that we want to know. We want to know they know us, um, so that we're not waiting for. You know, what, what often happens is we have the crises, and then we discover. We can be open about our tears. We can be open about our fears. We can be empathetic and hold the other person in our arms. But it takes a crisis um, to, to create that safety. And if we can intentionally do that in our most core important relationships so that we're not alone. And not just, you know, I was thinking about the character of Ginger, who's the dear friend of the mother of the children. And, and that ability to know she knows they know each other so that they don't have to work at building a relationship that's already in play. They have an intimacy that's between them that's already established. So the crisis doesn't become the beginning of that, but it becomes a resource that's already in place. So the more we can do intentional relationships, the more we can formulate closeness and let go of our fear of each other so that we can be open as to who we are and what our needs are. Why not? It yeah, and I, I will just add on to that, Robert, as you were talking, um, uh, particularly for men, I think it, it's going beyond the conversation about the weather and the eagles mm -hmm. and being willing to, to go deeper um, just in our everyday existence. And, um, and that is, the, we have to, we have to um, uh, exercise those muscles. We have to build up those muscles mm -hmm. of relationship, particularly yeah. for those of us that can be challenged by that and, mm -hmm. and um, going beyond the, the, the superficial. Yeah. And we can raise our children to experience it, the safety of feelings in our own, yes. in their own growing up so that they can trust <clears throat> being there for people with feelings as well as expressing their own. Yeah. Peter and Robert, we, we have a comment from an audience member that, that I think speaks for, for the entire audience. Um, this person wants to uh, express her gratitude for your sharing and for your loving gui guidance because grief is so hard. So thank yes. you. Yeah, thank you. Well, this really, it's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to spend time with Robert, but uh, I'm so glad that, that we've been able to um, 
uh, share all this time with, with all of you and thank you for your interest and um, Gretchen and Maria, again, for sponsoring this time together. Thanks very much. And wonderful. Thank you so much for being willing to do this. I would love to meet you in person sometime in the future when we're doing that. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. It's been wonderful to have you all here.